built on Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Why don't you turn to someone really quick and say good morning. Say we're glad you're here and may God bless you as you find your seat this morning. Faith Center, welcome. We want to take a moment, welcome everybody who's watching online. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Pastor Ben. I'm the youth pastor here at Faith Center. We're so glad everyone's joining us today. On behalf of Apostle Marla, Pastor Jonathan, the staff, the pastors, the volunteers, we want to say thank you for being here today. God got a great word planned for you today. Encourage you. It's going to do some life changing things. Amen. Amen. If this is your first time here at Faith Center, you are our honored guest. We're so glad you joined us this morning. In the seat pocket in front of you, you're going to find a welcome card like this. If you could take a quick moment, just fill it out after the service, out the glass doors to the left. I'll be there. I'd love to get to shake your hand, get to meet you, maybe answer any questions that you might have about Faith Center, all the great things that are happening here throughout the week and on Sundays. It's going to be a great time. All right. You guys good today? Come on, you good? Yeah. All right. There we go. I like that. That's my youth pastor side coming out. Are you guys ready to give this morning? Amen. I got a, a really quick encouragement for you with giving this morning. Be conscious of your position in Christ. Can I say that again? Be conscious of your position in Christ. John 15, 5, Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. You are his branches. He said it. He didn't say, hey, just try to be a branch. He said, no, you are a branch of me. Amen? Amen. Remain in Christ. How do we do that? 
by simply being conscious every day of your position in Christ. Because you have received Christ, you are in Christ, and he is in you, and you are his beloved. Amen? God accepts us because we are in him, and he loves us. That is how God sees you today in his presence. The enemy wants you to get focused on your condition instead of your position. The condition you are facing could be a financial lack. It could be a health issue. It could be your bank account, right? You could say, hey, my, my bank account, I'm going to stay connected to my bank account. Nothing wrong with having a bank account, but that's not what your provision is, amen? You could go to the gym every day. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the gym every day, but that's not where your health comes from, amen? It's being connected to our vine, Jesus Christ. The enemy wants you to focus on your condition, to forget about your position, that you are the righteousness of Christ, that you are seated with him in heavenly places, that you are with the Father at his right hand with Jesus. He wants you to forget that you're heir of God and you are joint heirs in Christ, amen? John 15 says that you will bear much fruit. This means you will, when you pray against any lack, Abundant supply will flow. When you pray for healing, sickness will leave. None of these things can be done on your own, but it's by staying in your position with Christ. Just like sap throws through the vine into the branches and produces fruit in your life, increases you in every area. The only thing you need to do is remain conscious of your position in Christ. Amen? Amen. We serve a good God today. Amen? You guys ready to give? Amen. Ushers, come on forward. Um, and I got to say this too, because I got excited about this scripture. I forgot to say this. There's many ways to give here at Faith Sitter. Uh, you can text to give. You can give online. And also, there's a QR code on your offering envelope. So if you're trying to scan the screen and you can't, you can just pull out this offering envelope. You can scan it. And that's an easy way to give too. Amen? How many of you guys are remaining in Christ today? Uh, all right, let's pray for these tithes and these offerings. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. Father, we thank you that you've made us the branches and you're the vine, you're the supply. God, we bear much fruit when we remain in you, conscious of our position, not our bank account, not where our health is, not what the doctors say, but what you say about us. Father, I pray for encouragement for our friends in this place today. God, if anybody's lacking anything, God, that you bring fruit, you bring life. We speak it in Jesus' name. We love you so much. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Go ahead and give. And as you're giving, I got a few announcements for you this morning. Uh, you can always find out what's going on here at Faith Center by looking at your awesome bulletin that your lovely greeters give you when you walk in. Amen. But we want to remind you that training to reign is going to begin here very soon for boys and girls from first grade to sixth grade. Uh, it is going to be at 6 p.m. It begins this Wednesday, October 2nd. All right, let's go. Registration is required. So if you want more information about that, I believe there's a table in the lobby. You can see the Mikas. The Mikas are here somewhere. They're always doing great things. Dr. Mika, the man. All right. You can find one of them in the lobby to register in the lobby, and you don't want to miss that. Also, we got some exciting news. Our The one and only Ed Trout will be here October 6th and 7th. You want to save these dates. How many of you guys enjoy Prophet Ed Trout? Come and get encouraged. Yeah, you give him a hand. Yeah, it's amazing. So these are the dates to save. Put them in your calendar, whatever you got your phone to remind you uh, it is going to be Sunday October 6th morning service and the evening service at 6 p.m. and also Monday October 7th at 6 30 don't miss these amazing opportunities to grow closer to the Lord amen Pastor Michelle's coming up give her a hand as she comes up to get us ready to get into some worship amen 
Good morning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I heard the Spirit of the Lord say you want to stand up because they're going to go back into worship. But this is what I heard him say, to decree some things over you. I decree that you will make it through this. That because Holy Spirit lives in you, you are filled with supernatural energy and strength. Your body is strong. Your eyes are open. Your mind is sharp. And your spirit is ready to step through the door of favor and influence that God has opened up for you. I decree that the Lord is filling you to the full of his passion as well as zeal for him. I decree that you are anointed, my God, with supernatural strength to accomplish every assignment in his name. I decree you will run and you will not get weary. You will walk and you will not faint. I decree you are moving past the revival mode and into thriving mode. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. I decree and I declare Ephesians 3 and 20 over your life. And I'm about to call up the five folk ministry leaders. And when you come up to the front, you need to stand, my God, in that place of believing that God is going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever think or even imagine according to the power that is already on the inside of you. This is your day. This is your hour, my God, to touch God like never before in the mighty name of Jesus.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. What he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. Oh, I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect submission. is my song, oh, praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. Oh, yeah, I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will Trust in God, my 
stay in this atmosphere for just a moment, just a moment longer. It's always great that we get to have moments of worship like this, right? We get to come in here and just forget about the things that are happening outside of these walls, outside of these doors. I know that everyone in here has something that is happening in your life. You have something that you're going through you have something that you're battling, and we get to come in here and say, I trust you, God. And for just, a, for just a moment before we go into the rest of the service, I want to invite you, can we just hold our arms out like this and close your eyes? This simple act of surrendering, this very simple act of surrendering, You know, when you surrender yourself to God, you are saying, God, I want you in my life. I want only you. Everything that is about me, everything that I've made about me, God, I put to the side. I lay down at your feet and I give you my life. Heavenly Father, we just ask as we're surrendering ourselves today that we give you our everything. We give you our hearts, God. We give you our mind. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, to be able to direct our path, to be able to guide us, Heavenly Father, in the life and the plan that you have for us. We surrender to that plan today. God, we want your will to be done. We don't want a feeling, we don't want an emotion, but God, we want Holy Spirit to move in such a way today that we can look at this service and we can say, God moved in a magnificent way. God moved in a mighty way. And it was because we got to surrender We got to surrender to God to allow him to do what he wanted to do in this place. So God, I just ask as we continue into this service that you be with us. Would you begin to open our hearts, open our ears for the word that you have. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we're able to receive it. 
we're able to apply it, and we're able to walk it out, God. And so, God, we thank you for this day again, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, church. All oh, thanks, Hannah. Amen. You know, worship should be a part of our everyday lives, church. You know, moments like this, they don't have to just happen on a Sunday morning, on a Wednesday night, at a Jesus concert or conference that we may go to. Worship happens as well in the everyday. When we're folding our laundry, when we're getting the kids ready for school, when we're making dinner, whatever it is, that can be an act of worship. If we're doing data entry at work, if we're on that assembly line at work, whatever it may be, do it unto the Lord. Give your very best. You know, we, we, we say in here that tithes and offerings, we're going to continue our worship with tithes and offerings, right? And the reason why we say that is because we, we are giving our best back to the Lord. We are, we are sacrificing, we are surrendering our very best to give back to the Lord because we want to give Him our best. You know, as Christians, there is this lifestyle that we have been called to live. There is this surrender that we must do. Amen? And, and I just wanted to take a moment before we got into this because I wanted us to be able to, again, I feel like sometimes it, it needs to click with us. Like we need to do it in our heads and we just need to do it as well in the physical. Like if we just do the simple act of surrendering ourselves, we get in that mindset of, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. As a Christian, I am supposed to surrender myself. And there is a surrender to the life that we are living. Giving it up to live for Christ. And you know, we were just in worship. And worship is being able to lower yourself so that you may lift His name on high, right? Worship is decreasing so that He may increase. And this lowering of yourself, this surrendering, is something that we must do consistently in our lives. You know, we've been hearing Apostle Marla talk a lot about consistency, right? Consistency, consistency. I feel like I hear it all the time when I go home as well. It's like, Harrison, we got to be consistent in this. And how our lives would look so different if we were just consistently in worship. If we were consistent, consistently lowering ourselves, surrendering ourselves. And maybe perhaps another way of putting this is being able to humble ourselves, right? And how many times maybe do we have to, we have to humble ourselves throughout the week, Right? How many of you guys in here? I know I'm not the only one. I have to humble myself every once in a while because there is, again, there are things that happen in our life that come up. They may try to throw us off. They, the, the enemy try to uh, make, catch us in a trap or something like that. And because we chose this life, this life of being a Christian, we chose to surrender our life for something greater. And so we must humble ourselves. And it can be really difficult sometimes to humble ourselves. I know there are many different things that come up throughout our days, our lives, that might be a challenge to get through and uh, to not give in into maybe the wrong things or maybe the things that the world has to offer. The things that the world has to offer. And I want to go ahead and I want to maybe label the things of this world as evil things. The things of this world are evil. And this is going to go ahead and this is going to bring us to our first scripture of the morning. And this is found in Mark 7, verses 20 through 23. Mark 7, verses 20 through 23. And uh, I'm going to be going old school. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. I feel like that's why I grew up reading. That was the Apostle Marla and the um, Apostle Don Lyon way. And so I want to bring it back today. No, pan, no passion translation. I know a lot of people feel, you, wouldn't, you would be surprised with how people feel about the different translations of the Bible. I think it's so funny that there's some people, oh, he's not looking, but I was going to say there's someone that I know that might be in the sound booth who doesn't like the Passion Translation. I'm not going to say a name. There's only a few of them back there, so you guys can figure that out if you want to. But Mark 7, 20 through 23. Mark 7, 20 through 23. It says this, and this is Jesus talking, and he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. And so the, to give a little bit of context of where this verse is even coming from, uh, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees because those Pharisees, they just had to find something to go and get 
on someone about, just to, like they're the popo, they're just always walking around, and they're going to tell people what you can and cannot do. And so they fire the disciples, and they say that the disciples are eating in defilement. Well, what does that mean? It means that in this time, there was a Jewish custom in how you were to clean your hands before you ate. And so the disciples did not do that. They did not do what was custom. Instead, they had dirty hands. I hope that y'all wash your hands before you eat because it's very important that your hygiene is maintained and cleanliness and all of that. So I encourage you guys, make sure you wash your hands. But the Pharisees come, amen, thank you. But the Pharisees come and they say, hey, you know, like, you guys are eating in defilement. And Jesus comes into the picture, and it's always, you know, I feel like Jesus is right there. Where these Pharisees are always there trying to point out the flaws. Jesus is right there to say, well, listen, this is what defilement used to be. But I'm here to tell you that this is no longer what defilement is. And Jesus tells them that defilement is not uh, this physical and what you see, but rather it's what comes out of a man. So what comes out of a man is what defiles him. And so Jesus explains that defilement is not in the physical, like the Pharisees thought, but instead, this is something that is spiritual. And where I want to be able to take that to is because for something to come out of a person, for us to be able to say the words that we may say or be able to act a certain way, it comes from a certain place. Before it comes into our heart, it has to come from a place, right? Right? It has to be coming from somewhere. So for these things to manifest or come out of someone, it has to come from somewhere. Somewhere, these things, these evil things, have come into our heart. And so, maybe to give some uh, examples of this, if I'm in an environment where gossip is present, though I'm not the one that's gossiping or talking bad about somebody, but I'm in an environment and someone's coming up to me and say, hey, did you hear what so-and-so did? Did you just hear how they just, like, reacted to this? Or did, can you believe that they just did this? Instead of, you know, speaking life, which is what we're supposed to do as Christians, they're coming up, they're maybe saying some crass things, or maybe saying some things that aren't true, you know, gossip. We're all familiar with gossip, stay away from that gossip. But if I'm around that, if I'm in the environment, though I'm not participating in something like that, but they're coming up and they're talking to me and they're telling me all about this and what this person did, though I'm not engaging with it, I am still very much present. And I'm very much opening myself up and allowing that into my heart. And so if I'm allowing that into my heart, guess what might come out eventually? Gossip. I might find myself in a different environment, and I might start talking about somebody. Or maybe to give it another example, how many of you guys like watching TV? Well, not many hands come up. Come on. All you guys are scholars and readers. Good for you. <laughs> TV rots the brain. But if you're watching TV, you're watching your favorite program, and all of a sudden there's a scene that pops up onto the screen, and it's a scene that you probably should not be watching. I think you guys can kind of guess what I'm talking about. But instead, you look at that, and you're like, oh, you know what? It'll be over in like five to ten seconds. It doesn't even matter. Like, I'll just watch it. It'll be fine. And instead of just skipping through or just jumping to the next episode or just not even watching that TV show, you instead sit there and you watch what happens on that TV for the next five to ten seconds. And so then what happens is, because you are watching this, because you are listening to this, you are allowing this into your heart, and so guess what might manifest? Guess what might come out eventually? That desire to have what you just saw on that television. And so these things that, you know, we may come uh, to uh, watch or listen to, though we might not realize it, these things can very much still enter in. Though you feel like you're on guard, these things still might enter in. So these spirits, the spirit of slander, spirit of lust, these are evils that are sent from Satan. That he has dispersed through the world, playing in our culture, in our society. And what can happen is we maybe, again, we unknowingly receive these things. You know, I think sometimes as Christians we feel like we're invincible, that nothing can stop us. And I want to just tell you guys that there's a certain verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 4.23. And it says, guard your heart. For from it flow the things of life. So that means, in, in, in that translation, what heart means is your thoughts, your wills, and your discernment. So make sure you're guarding your thoughts. Make sure you're guarding your wills. Make sure you're guarding your discernment. It's so important, church, that as Christians, we are watching what we are allowing in to our hearts. And if you want a little bit more on that, I encourage you to come out to Wednesday nights and hear Pastor Bev talk about it. Because I think some of you guys might be shocked how much you might be allowing into your heart. 
And so Jesus states that all these evil things come from within our hearts. And if you notice, some of these things are very, again, the worldly. As I said, Satan plants these things within our world, within our culture and society. And there's one of these that stick out to me, and that's the one that I really want to press into this morning, and that evil is pride. And so if you're taking notes today, the title of my message is Pride, a False Identity. Pride, a False Identity. Uh, pride has many different meanings, has many different definitions. I think that today we could say uh, all these different things that pride is. And Webster defines pride as a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated, or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. So some examples of this is if you have a son or a daughter and they graduate from either high school or college or they uh, are receiving an award and so you go to that graduation ceremony or that award ceremony and you see them walk across that stage, you get so proud of your son and daughter, right? Like you have this feeling of, I am so proud of you. Like you take pride in the fact that your son or your daughter was able to accomplish what they set out to do, right? So maybe another example is, uh, how many of you guys are very passionate about the work that you do? Yes, thank you, Pastor. You better be passionate. You're working in the church. Come on now. <laughs> but I know there's a lot of people in here that we're very passionate, and maybe we love doing what we're doing, right, in, our, in, our, in the workplace. Like, I can think about my dad. And uh, for those who don't know, my dad is a stone worker. On top of that, he is a very talented stone worker, though he would never tell you that. But he is very precise. He likes things a certain way. And uh, he's been doing it for over 40 years. Now, if you were to go up to him and say, hey, Pastor Jonathan, like, tell me about the last project that you just did. I kid you not, I can almost guarantee he would pull out his phone. He would show you all the pictures. He would show you some videos as well. He would go into all the details about the length and the width. He would tell you about what kind of edge that they had to put on the granite countertop. He would tell you about how they had to cut it out of the slab and the way that they wanted to cut it out of the slab. It had the veins running through in a certain way where he wanted to run it through on the bathroom vanity or something like that and then run up onto the backsplash. And he would give you all the details. And so if you're wanting to sit there for 30 minutes, just be ready for it. But he'll do it. And that's just because he's so passionate about it, right? He, he takes pride in the work that he does because he's able to look at it. He knows that he put his very best to it. And he loves being able to show people what he was able to accomplish. And so maybe these are some examples of pride that we can look at today. However, I want to, because we're in church and we're Christians and we read the Bible, and whenever we read that Bible, we see that word pride come up, it kind of has a negative meaning to it. And so what's the maybe negative meaning of pride that we can read about in the Bible. And this is why I believe to probably be the most fitting for it. It is a higher love and focus on oneself. Finding your opinions and thoughts over God's authoritative word. And so we know about many sins and many evils, and we just read about some of them, right? We read about adultery, fornication, deceit, blasphemy, lies. But pride is one that I believe to be the root of all these evils. And how many of you guys have maybe heard that before? Like, you've probably heard that pride is the root of all evil, or pride is the root of all sin, and there's a reason why I believe this. If you were to take any sin, any sinful act or thought, it comes from a place where our flesh wants something. It comes from a place where you put yourself higher than whatever may be happening. Our flesh wants a lustful desire. Our flesh wants to steal something. Our flesh wants to glorify something that we did. It's our wants, our desires, our truths over what is actual truth, over what we actually should be desiring, what we should be wanting. And this is where it becomes pride. It's because you place those things above what maybe should be done. You place those things above what God's truth is. Instead of, instead of thinking, you know, this is God's truth, I should probably follow that, you follow your own truth. And again, pride is a fleshly evil, and our flesh only looks out after ourselves. I want to say that one more time. Your flesh only looks out after yourself, what your best interest will be. And so, this false identity. How is pride this false identity? False identity meaning being something or someone that you are not. 
Because doing things in your best interest is not who God called you to be. Doing things that make you feel good, you sound better than, look better than, is not who God called you to be. You know, we, we just took, again, like, because we just took a moment to acknowledge God, right? We took a moment to surrender. We took a moment to humble ourselves. And as Christians, this is a walk that we must consistently do. We must consistently be lowering ourselves. And oftentimes we, we get to a place where, you know, well, my identity is, you know, this is my personality. Right here is something, this is who I am. And the question is, is that who God called you to be? Because I can tell you that is not who God called you to be. As a child of God, God has greater plans for you. As a Christian, God has greater plans for you. And so I want us to look at a familiar story this morning. This is the story of Samson. Everyone say Samson. And so uh, this story is found in Judges 13. And so if you want to turn there, that's where we're going to be reading from for a little bit. And uh, to maybe give a little bit of uh, some context of where this story is starting. The story starts with an angel of the Lord appearing to Samson's mom to tell her who her son is going to be. His identity. His purpose. The angel of the Lord is about to tell her everything there is to need to know about her son. I'm sorry, this thing is like wild, and I feel like it's about to fall off. I need to get like a double headset or something. And so this is where the story starts in Judges 13, verses 3 through 5. Judges 13, verses 3 through 5. It says this, And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are infertile and have no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Therefore, be careful not to drink any wine or any other intoxicating drink, and do not eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from birth, and he shall begin to rescue Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So this is Samson's identity. This is who God has called Samson to be. It's very clear as day, right? Like, we just read about some of these things that Samson needs to abide by, right? So he has been called to be a Nazarite. Well, what does that mean? A Nazarite has three things that they need to follow. They need to make sure that they do not drink any alcohol. They need to make sure that they don't touch anything unclean, meaning dead bodies or corpses. As well, they are not allowed to cut their hair. As well, we know that we just uh, read that the angel of the Lord told Samson's mom that the reason why he is coming in the first place is to help Israel be freed from the oppression of the Philistines. And so this is the thing, is that Samson knows his identity. Before before we get into the rest of the story, I want to just let you guys know, Samson knows his identity. He knows what he has been called to do. It's very black and white, and I want that to be a message for someone in here today, because I think sometimes we think, oh, well, you know, like, where I'm going is just so in the gray. Like, I don't know where God is taking me next, and I want to tell you that that's not God, that that's the enemy trying to throw you off, trying to distract you, throw you off the, uh, for the plans that God has for you, and I encourage you, after this service, or maybe even, like, when we're ending the service, if you have something that you're not sure of, that you feel like you're in that gray, I promise you that God will make it so clear. Our God is a God of yes and no. It's very hot and cold. Like, he, he will let you know if where you're going is not the right direction. He will let you know of what he has for you. And we sang about that, right? We sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. So again, Samson's life is not in the gray. It's very clear what his purpose is. Let's go ahead and let's jump into chapter 14. The story continues with Samson going to get married. Now, the thing about this marriage is that Samson actually chooses to marry a Philistine. Everyone's like, ugh, those Philistines. What are you doing, Samson? Like, why are you going to go and marry this Philistine? And on his way to this wedding planning, he's attacked by this lion. But the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, and he's able to rip this lion apart, and he doesn't tell his parents what had happened. And so let's jump into Judges 14, verses 8 through 9. And it says this, when he returned later to take her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the body of the lion. So he scraped the honey out into his hands and went on, eating as he went. When he came to his father and mother, he gave them some, and they ate it. But he did not tell them he had taken the honey from the body of the lion. And so we see that Samson touches a dead body. He touches this corpse. Not only that, he pulls honey from this beehive that was in this carcass. So also, 
He's eating in defilement, but also he's touching this dead body. And I'm sorry, but this is some, like, Discovery Channel, man versus wild, bear grills type of stuff. Like, I don't think anyone in here could possibly stomach pulling in uh, or pulling out this honey from this beehive that's in a lion's carcass. I don't even know if I could watch something. Like, if they were to air that on Discovery Channel, I don't even think I would be able to even watch that. But so not long after this, Samson holds a feast for seven days in celebration of the wedding. And the thing to know about these wedding ceremonies and celebrations is that these lasted for a week. And oftentimes, the main focus and one of the main things that were happening in these celebrations were the drinking of wine and alcohol. So filled with lots of drinking. And no, the, uh, the Bible doesn't explicitly mention Samson drinking, we can already kind of start to see, though, that there is this identity issue, that Samson likes to do what he wants to do. And the part of the story that Samson, uh, that we all know about, is after this wedding, he leaves his wife, just married her, leaves her, and instead he goes and he finds Delilah, the harlot, sleeps with her, stays with her, gives her the, the secret to the source of his strength. And we know that she cuts his hair, and then from there she sells him to the Philistines. And so what's the point of me telling this story? Harrison, where are you going with this? I'm not really sure where you're going with this. Samson lived how he wanted to live. Samson had been given this identity. He had been called. He had been given this uh, purpose. He had been given a destiny. Yet he wanted to do what he wanted to do. He lived in pride. Pride is a false identity, pretending to be something that you're not. Pride gives you an identity that is not from the Lord. Living in sin, thinking that you're fine, that you're covered, that you're sufficient as is, and you know the difference between the right and the wrong, that you don't need that accountability, that you're fine the way you are. Well, you know, that's just my personality, Harrison. All of those things, however you would like to put it, is a false identity and something that has not been given to you from the Lord. And Samson lived his life how he wanted to live. A man who had so much strength, believed that he could take care of himself, believed he could partake in whatever he wanted to, believed that nothing could take him out. He lived how he wanted to live. And we see that he broke the three and only commands that God had given him. Like, God gave you three things not to do. How easy that is, right? How many of you guys would love three things to be able to just live by, right? All of us, probably, because then it's like, oh, that's so easy. Like, yeah, just by the way, don't drink, uh, don't cut my hair, and don't touch a dead body. <laughs> Sounds pretty simple, right? So he touched and ate honey from a carcass. He was part of this wedding celebration that obviously involved drinking. He gave away the secret to all of his strength, all for the sake of how he saw himself, how it made him feel. And even though he knew that God had called him, given him an identity, and given him a purpose, and yes, God was still able to use him for that purpose. We know at the very, very end of the story of Samson is that he was able to reconcile this relationship with God and was able to slay more Philistines that day than he had his entire life. However, Samson still lived in pride. And maybe a way that we could view this is that Samson knew he had been called by God, but lived of the world lived by the world's standards, how the world wanted him to live. In John 17, 14, Jesus prays this over his disciples. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Samson was called to not be of this world. And the Philistines knew this because they knew about Samson's power. They knew, you know, they, they knew who God had called them to be. They knew this type of strength. They knew that he was the one that was going to help the Israelites be freed from the Philistines. And, you know, I believe that we see this today. We see people who are saved by choosing to live and be a part of the world when we know we are in the world, but we have been called to not be of the world. Yes, church, and, you know, as Christians, we live in this world. We go about it. There's things that, you know, we can't avoid, that the world is pushing, like, pushing at us, pressing on us. There are things that we can't avoid, but that doesn't mean that we give in to those things. As Christians, yes, we are in this world, but we have been called to not be of the world. In 1 John 2.16, it says this, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life 
is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Church, this is a false identity. Being someone that you are not. Being the opposite of who God has called you to be. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, when we ask God to be the Lord of our life, when we're sitting in worship and we're saying, you know what, God, I surrender myself to you. When we give him our everything, we are saying yes to his plan. We are saying yes to his will for our life. Amen? Walking as a Christian. And however you want to label that. I know like we, we like our titles. We're, well, I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. Whatever it is that you want to be able to define that is, you are his and you are not the world's. You have been no longer called to live like the world. A very famous verse that I think that we can all co- quote is Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper, for hope, and for a future. Sounds really good, doesn't it? Something that we can turn to when we're feeling really like distraught. And it's like, well, I don't really know what's going to be coming up next. But there's so much truth within that verse that I think sometimes we just forget about it. And as far as, hey, you know, God has a plan for you. Though the world is maybe trying to push an agenda on you, trying to push a plan on you, God has a better plan for you. He has a plan for you to prosper. He has plans for you that involve hope and a greater future than what you could ever think or imagine. And for some reason, I find that we really struggle with this. We really struggle uh, with this identity. Even though we have accepted the calling, we've accepted that Jesus is our Savior, It's hard for us to submit fully to this identity, that we are a new creation in Christ. And this is how it pertains to us. Because as as Christians who have surrendered ourselves to God, we have given our hearts to Him. We are still choosing to live and act how we want to. Though we have said yes to Christ, though we come to church every Sunday, we still like doing what we want to do. We still enjoy doing what we want to do. And then this is the issue. We live how we want to live. We, we claim to be Christians, and so we are walking like the world and how the world is acting and all those things. And then what happens is we bring that into the church. We allow those things to come into these doors. And pride has maneuvered itself into the hearts of men and women, unfortunately, who attend church, who serve in church, and as well even lead within the church. The church as a whole, I'm not saying just faith center, I'm not just saying life church, city first, or whatever church is in the Rockford region. I'm saying the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ, the church as a whole. And so we let these things into our doors and we allow them to come on in and then maybe sometimes we give in to what the world is trying to do and we're wanting maybe to look uh, like the world and we want to kind of give in to the world as well. And so it's interesting because that means something is coming in, something that might be evil, something that might be of this world, and then we're putting it right back out. Kind of sounds like defilement, doesn't it, church? Kind of sounds like We're in defilement. Now, I know that the church is a place where hurting people come, uh, where those who maybe are walking in sin, they attend, and we're looking for God's help, and that is what this place is meant to be for. But it's when people don't bring those things to the altar, and they continue to allow them to be their false identity. They allow them to be still a part of their life. You know, there are people who call themselves, and this is, I just want to give a time out real quick. I am not pointing any finger, so if you take offense to this, that's between you and the Lord. And that's fine with me, because I'm not pointing a finger. I'm just saying in general, okay? Can I get a thumbs up real quick? Okay, great. I love you guys and everyone in here. I love people. But there are people who call themselves Christians, and they act like they're better than most. Well, you know, Harrison, I've been saved for 30 years. I'm a little bit more spiritually mature. I know the voice of God, and I know what he said. I can discern things, Harrison. Don't worry. I can speak in tongues for at least three hours. That's fantastic. But sometimes those type of people can be too prideful, and they won't allow God to maybe show them something new. Show them what they need to work on still. Because I want to tell you something. There is absolutely no difference between someone 
who has been saved for one year and someone who's been saved for 50 years. Because our life should be consistently lowering ourselves, submitting to Christ, being able to hear his word, his voice, well, who he calls us to be. And to be honest, I think that there's times where I enjoy being able to be around someone who's only been saved for a year because they're more hungry. They want to know more of God. They want to know more about who God has called them to be. Whereas you have someone who's been saved for a really long time, they can get pretty content, right? They can get pretty complacent. And they can say, well, you know what? I've had my fair share. Well, you know what, Harrison? I've done this. I've done that. I've served within the church. That's great. But did you know God still wants to use you? God still has a word for you. The story's not done yet. And it seems that the Western church has been built up to look and sound a certain way, behave a certain way. And a lot of this has been built up to look like a facade. And I want to be able to explain that for a moment. I was happy that the Lord placed this word as I was writing this message, because this is what a facade is. It is an outward appearance that is maintained to conceal a less pleasant or credible reality. Y'all, there are some things, there, there are some churches that have created a false identity. There are some churches who have created something to help cover, to make it look like something that the world is doing. Like, to make it look like, okay, that looks pretty or that looks good. You know, we, we want that to be on the outside as well. We want it to look like this. We want it to sound like this. Instead of actually just being who God wanted the church to be. Instead of just being a place where people are able to come and worship, to be able to lay down their lives, to be able to ask God for forgiveness for their sins. Because maybe, yes, what is being presented is Jesus, but to get to him, you need all of these things. You need a booming sound system, moving lights, an awesome welcoming team, an encouraging message that maybe brings at least 10 salvations down to the altar. You need to be praying in tongues for at least 20 minutes. You need to be lifting your voice and giving him a shout of praise. And if you're not hitting these things, then you're probably not experiencing Jesus and the Holy Spirit. If you're not hitting these things, is it really even church? And it's something that the church can create from all these things is religion. Religion being a false identity. Why? Because Jesus came to break religion, y'all. Yeah. Jesus came to break that religion. He came to show that how the Pharisees thought, lived, and taught the old law, the old covenant, is no longer the way that things are going to be. He came to establish this new covenant. And just to go back and reference Mark 7, 20, you know, we see that Again, Jesus comes to tell the Pharisees, hey, listen, this is what you guys thought. I know this is probably what you guys were trained to do and trained to know, but this is now what defilement is. This is now what the Lord says. As well, religion is pride because we set the new standard. We say how things need to be within the church. Instead of just remembering who Jesus has called us to be. It's us. We put up a new standard. We put up a new law. We put up something that must be identified within the church. Rather than remembering who Jesus had called the church to be. And now I, I want to be clear as well that I'm not saying that you can't have these things. Like I'm not saying that you can't be speaking in tongues for 20 minutes. I'm not saying that you can't have moving lights or booming sound because I love a booming sound. I love worship when it's going, it's getting hard. And also when Colin's leading, man, that dude, so good. Yeah, we can clap for him, he's good. So humble. Like, no, not me, not me. So I'm, saying that you can, I'm not saying that you can't have these things in church, but I also want to be clear, I'm not saying, like, these things aren't the Antichrist, okay? I think that we, sometimes we can look at that booming sound system and we're like, ugh, that's the devil. Ugh, like, I can't believe that they did this today. Those moving lights, they were all over the place. It's like, no, no, no. Because I want to also be clear on something, that there are a lot of people who put time and effort into some of those things, and for them, that is their act of worship. That is them being able to give their very best to the Lord. But here's the issue, is that now more than ever, is that we have people who need Jesus, and the church might be really great at doing all these things, but are we more focused on the system rather than the why? Are we more focused on the looks and the feels rather than who we're trying to reach? Are we more focused on getting to our seat and making sure that no one is sitting in that seat rather than maybe being open to sit somewhere new and being able to meet somebody new? 
You know, we can get pretty good at praying in tongues consistently, sitting in church, taking notes during the message, but don't have time to maybe help, serve, or volunteer. Well, Harrison, I don't really see how that maybe can be pride. It's because you're sticking with what you want to do, rather than allowing God to direct you and call you into where he wants you to be. And I'm not trying to target anybody. Again, as I mentioned before, this is not me trying to point a finger. I'm just wanting to warn all of us in here that being complacent, being comfortable, might feel good for a little bit, but God has called us to do so much more. God has a plan for each and every person that is sitting in this room. God has a plan for each and every person that's even outside these doors. The saved and the unsaved. God has a plan. But there becomes this certain identity. And I'm not saying, again, this happens in every church in America, but probably there are some of you in here that you can say, yeah, I've I've seen that, or maybe I've experienced that. And it breaks my heart to see some of these happening, but it breaks my heart as well to see and think that Christians, you know, the ones who we claim, we claim to be, you know, God's people, you know, we've been set apart The Lord has called me to come and do these things. Christians thinking that they're a little bit better than, that they know a little bit better, that they can create their own rules, they can create their own agendas. And I want to tell you guys today, it's 100% pride. 100% pride. Hey, Cam, can I actually just take this thing off? I'm sorry, y'all. This thing is bothering me. I keep fixing it. Hello? 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 I'm sorry. I was getting distracted. This thing is like throwing me off. Creating our own agendas. As Christians, we have been called to submit. We've been called to surrender. And something that I want to be able to deliver you all today, and this is something that I would actually encourage you guys to maybe write down or place within your phone, because this is going to be a great reminder for you to understand why pride is so important that we, like, we observe and that we recognize as a great evil. And this is what the Lord dropped in my heart. And this is where this whole message even came from in the first place. And that is, pride is the fall of the bride. Pride is the fall of the bride. If we are not making Christ the center of why we're meeting, if we are putting our wants, our desires, our ideas, our beliefs, our false identities first then we will fall. When people walk into church, they should be able to sense the love of Christ, right? They should be able to feel right at home. They they should be able to walk in through those doors and say, there is something different that is happening here at Faith Center. There is something that's different about this church. And I want to be here. I want to be a part of it. Real quick, growing up, uh, grew up here in this church and um, there was a lot of pastors here growing up. And uh, I remember growing up, it was very important that I made sure that I called every pastor by their title, including my family members, Pastor Brad, Pastor Chad. Now, Harrison, when you are at church, you call them pastor. When they're at home, they're just Brad and Chad. Okay, got it. Uncle Brad. <sighs> Titles. And I remember I was so careful. I had to make sure that I called them by their title. I was like, I mean, I, did, I was scared to call them, like, not by their title because I knew that there were times I got yelled at for not calling someone by their title. Well, that's Pastor Dave, or that's Pastor Chad, that's Pastor Brad. And it's like, okay, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to. It's okay. And I remember growing up, moving away for school, I went down to South Carolina. And at the school I went to, I went to a private university, and I got to meet the campus pastor of the university. And I remember meeting him. He came up to me. The guy had so much energy. It was so funny. He, he would always talk about how he loved Jesus, and he also loved those uh, Texas honey rolls from uh, Texas Roadhouse. But he would come up to me. He's like, what's going on, man? What's your name? And I'm like, Harrison, like, what's your name? He's like, oh, I'm John. And I'm like, oh, well, what do you do? He's like, I'm the campus pastor here at CSU. And I'm like, oh, so do you want me to call you Pastor John? No, 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 no. I'm John. You can just call me John. And I'm like, okay, nice to meet you, John. I remember meeting my lead pastor at the church that I attended as well. How he introduced himself. He's like, hey, my name is Rodney. Yet he was Pastor Rodney. He wanted to come up to me and say, hey, listen, my name is Rodney. 
And what I was able to take from that is I know that, and even for me, and if you come up and talk to me and you say, hey, Pastor Harrison, I might say, like, after 10 times, I might say something like, hey, don't worry. You don't need to call me Pastor Harrison. I know your heart. I know, I know you know who I am. I know that you're going to give honor when honor is due and all that stuff. But please, just call me Harrison. And where am I going with this? It's because what good does it do if I believe that every person that walks in needs to focus more on my title, the title of the, of the lead pastor of this church, they focus more on that rather than the love that we are trying to share. Who we're here for. You know, we're not here for Pastor Harrison. We're not here for Apostle Marla. We're not here for any other pastor that might try to come up on the stage and give a word. We're not here for them. We are here for the Lord. What good does it do to have a status and have that be a greater focus than why we are here? Have that be a greater focus than Jesus. And I won't even put this in terms of having a title because I want to be able to use all of you guys in here as well. If you get to a point where you find yourself higher than, better than, or deserve to be seen as, pride has entered in. Pride may abide in your life. I know, uh, real quick, an example, I think about, and I think I mentioned this at our last Young Adults because we had talked about pride, but I think it's so interesting because this happened to me, and so this is where the Lord convicted me, is there are times, I think, that we can sit through a message and we hear something that's like, oh, that's so good. Well, I hope so-and-so is listening to this. Oh, man, Apostle Marla nailed it. I I thought she did so good. The word that she gave, I could tell it was right from the Lord. But I hope Pam was listening to this. And and where it convicted me so much is because I... (laughs) There's, I mean, man, if you allow God, God will shake you up. God will, God will stir you up a little bit. But where, where it caught me off and where the Lord convicted me is because he was saying, Harrison, how come you won't accept that truth? But instead, you're more concerned about somebody else. When yet you just heard that truth, you just understood what it was that just was spoken. Why don't you receive that? Let me worry about this person. You worry about yourself. And as Christians, I want to be able to encourage us that as we're sitting in a service, I know sometimes we're maybe thinking like, oh, well, I want so-and-so to listen to this message. That's fine. But as soon as it becomes a place of like, well, you know, that wasn't really meant for me, but I know for a fact it was for Pam. I'm only saying your name because you're right there. I'm sorry. I know you're listening. But church, we have to be careful that we're not acting better than, feeling like we're the best of the best how we're being seen as, you know, it's okay if you're not completely put together because that's why you're coming to church, right? So then you can be put together. Romans 12, 16 says this, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Y'all, pride in the church is thinking that you're holier than the person that you're sitting next to. Pride in the church is thinking that you can tune out part of a message because you already know better and that you are better than. Pride in the church is thinking that you have your own seat and there better not be anybody sitting in that seat. Pride in the church is thinking that people should come to you rather than you go and meet them. Pride in the church is refusing to hear what a woman pastor has to deliver on a Sunday morning when what difference does it make because she is adhering and listening to Holy Spirit and wants to come and listen and deliver what God has given her to release. I will stand by that. I will fight tooth and nail for my mom. Because I know for a fact, I think, and yeah, it's my mom, but I want you guys to know something. She does so much here at this church. And she tells me my greatest focus is getting in that pulpit, being able to deliver what I believe that God has placed in my heart for the church to be able to hear. And I want you guys to know, though she might not be able to come and talk to you all the time, she loves you. All those prayer requests that you write on the back of those welcome cards, she takes them and she prays over every single one of them. And I know, I know it can be touchy-feely, and it's like, oh, well, you know, women pastors. And I just want to say, what difference does it make for the person who is standing up here? If they're white, if they're black, if they're Latino, if they're a woman, if they're a man, if they are listening to Holy Spirit and God has given them a word, allow God to, oh, man, allow God to be able to open your heart and receive that word. 
I got to keep moving. I'm sorry. I could sit on that forever. And here's the thing. This is, this is the good news. Are you guys ready for some good news? Because I know we've just been talking about pride. It's a lot of like, oh, that pride doesn't sound very good. But here's the good news. For everything in life, there are opposites. Where there is evil, there is good. And so if pride is the evil, then what must be the good? Humility. Humility is the good. If pride is what has been the identity, it has been the center of whatever it is, then humility is the answer to how we should be living and walking our lives. Being able to submit, to listen, and follow Jesus is 100% based on humility. By saying yes to Christ, you have now said, Jesus, Everything there is about me, the sinful lifestyle, how I was walking my life and how I was doing my life, whatever I did to make me feel good, look good, I put it to the side and I give my life to you. I give you my everything. You are submitting and putting something greater above you in your life. That is humility. You are lowering yourself to make his name high. That is humility. You are decreasing so that he may what? Increase. That is humility. Church, if you want to have a blessed life, you have to walk in humility. Because God is wanting to bless you. And some of us in here today may think that we don't need it because, you know, we already got enough. We already have enough from the world's standards and what the world has given us. We already have enough. We're good. But when you humble yourself, you are saying that you are nothing without him. That your life is nothing you will continually search after what the world has to offer, and that void will cons- consistently be in your heart. Looking for ways to fill it, looking for things to, to please it, desires, whatever, wants. It will never fill that void. Jesus is the only one that can fill that void. Proverbs 22, verse 4 says this. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. By humility and the fear of the Lord our riches and honor and life. Humility, being able to humble yourself, lower yourself, surrender yourself to him. The fear of the Lord, understanding who our God is. You know, I love when Rhea Briscoe comes, I know I always love because she says something. She says, my Jesus. Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. Church, let me tell you about our God. He is so great. He is so good. He is so faithful. His grace and his mercy, they are so great. Worthy is our God. I want to give a quick testimony real quick as we're wrapping up here. Because as I read over this verse, I'm like, I kind of want to be able to share this. Um, Moved away to South Carolina and I moved back here. That process was not a fun process. Because... I had to do something that I really didn't want to do. And it all started with me driving down the highway one day. I could feel that there was something changing in my life. I didn't really know what it was. I didn't really know what God was wanting me to do. And maybe you guys have heard this before, but I want you to hear it again. And I just remember, I was like, okay, well, you know, I feel like I'm disconnecting from my community. I feel like God is taking me somewhere new as far as work. And, you know, I kind of want to live somewhere new. Perks of being single, you can move and live wherever you want to without having to talk to someone about it. And so I was just thinking, you know, God, like, we're, well, you know, would this work out? What, could I move here? Could I go and do this? Anywhere but Rockford, Illinois. And I remember driving down the highway because it just got to a point where I was just, I was at a breaking point. And I remember yelling at God, saying, God, what do you want me to do? Because right now, I have no idea. I'm lost. I can feel something's happening, but I just need you to give me clarity. Make it black and white for me, God. Yes and no. And not long after that, I remember waking up, Holy Spirit had prompted me to go and turn in my resignation. I heard it so clearly, so clearly, put in your resignation. Had nothing lined up. And I remember that was in the fall of 2020. I remember coming back here uh, January 2021 for my parents' commissioning. And, uh, and as they were being commissioned, that was a morning where Ed Trow was here. He was ministering, and he turned to me, and he essentially told me, it's time to stop being like Jonah and running from your Nineveh. Didn't really give much more than that, other than, like, it's time for you to be a pastor. 
and uh, didn't talk to anyone about it. My brother drove me into the airport, didn't talk to him about it. It was just between me and the Lord. As any time you receive something like that, take it to the Lord. Don't talk about it with other people because then you're going to get your feelings mixed up in it. You're going to get your emotions mixed up in it. How about you just take it to the Lord because he will give it to you straight. And I remember talking to the Lord about it and the Lord saying, this is what you're going to do. You're going to move back to Rockford. Are you sure, God? Is that what you want me to do? And I tell you that story, and I tell you that because I wanted to live my life how I wanted to live my life. Though I claimed this title of being a Christian, someone who loves God, I want to chase after him all the rest of my days. I want nothing more but to be in his presence. That was my personality. That's how much I loved him. I want to be a part of a small group. I want to be a part of the worship team. I want to be able to serve. I love my God. I love my Jesus. But I realized I wanted to do what would make me feel good, what was going to satisfy me, my needs, how it was going to make me look. And I had to surrender myself to him. I had to humble myself and say, you know, Rockford isn't really the place where I want to move back to. But I know through humility and through the fear of the Lord, our riches and honor and life. You know, pride is the fall of the bride. But can I tell you something? That fertility, humility brings fertility. And what is fertility? Fertility is life. And what am I trying to get to? trying to say that there are people in here who need to maybe start tilling their hearts. There are some of us in here who need to start tilling our hearts to start to get fertile so that we may be able to have life come forth. That we might be able to have life start to come out of us. Instead of being in defilement, living in defilement, and allowing the things that are coming into our heart and then coming out of our mouth, let's instead start having life come in and life leave. You get this by surrendering yourself, church. You get this by saying yes to him through humility. In John 1, 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Some of us in here, we need to start tilling up our hearts. We need to start shaking up that ground. And you know, when you till up the ground, do you know what you're doing? You're breaking it up. You're breaking it up so that you can allow something there to grow. You're allowing Jesus, the one who brings life, into your heart. And you know, some of us in here, we've built up some things in our heart, and, uh, and, and I want to tell you that God is wanting to maybe break some of those things today. Some of us in here, we've been, we've been building up pride. We've been building up hurt. We've been building up uh, jealousy. We've been building up envy. We've been building up strife. We've been building up adultery. We've been building up lust. Whatever it may be, it might be building up in our hearts, but I want to tell you today that God wants to break your heart. God wants there to be life in your heart. Church, I know that this is, I feel like I've been very repetitive today and just the surrendering and what pride is and how it can always be about us. But church, it's not all about us. It's about Jesus. And it's about surrendering our life to him. Would you stand with me? All the different evils and the different sins that may be stored up in our hearts, God is ready to shake up and bring out life. And where pride abides, we'll be replaced with humility. Where religion abides, God wants to replace with freedom. I want to encourage you today. What's about to happen next is we're about to sing a song. And as we're singing this song, I want you to be able to take a moment to reflect. I want you to be able to take a moment. And if there is something that you need to bring to the altar, bring it to the altar. And I know that there's a lot of us in here, again, there's a lot of things that we're building up in our hearts. There's a lot of things that we're carrying. And I want to be able to tell you today that if you just let God be the Lord of your life, if you just let him give you the plans that he has for you, there's going to be life. I encourage you to let go of those things that maybe you think define you in this world. Because again, the world has nothing to offer in comparison to the riches and the glory that our Jesus, that our God has for us. Amen.
And so I want to go ahead, I want to pray to open this moment, and I want to come back and I'll pray us out. But in this room, if, if you want to come, if you want to come to the altar, if you want to be able to lay those things down on the altar, the altar is open. As well, if you are in here and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, the altar is open. Our Jesus will never fail you. He will be sufficient, and all of the things that he has to offer are far greater than what this world has to offer. Amen? So God, I just ask that right now as we're about to go into worship, that we just begin to posture our hearts. We begin to surrender ourselves to what it is that you want us to do in this moment, God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we bring those things to the altar, we lay them down, that we will never turn back. And as we walk out through these doors, God, that we're able to walk in freedom, that we're able to walk in truth, and able to walk in the identity that you have given us, being a child of God, being a new creation, being a Christian, God. And so, God, we just give you this moment. We ask that you be here. Would you begin, again, shaking up the ground? Would you shake up the ground, shake up our hearts of all those things that have been built up, God, how we're still living, how we're still uh, putting in, in front of us, Heavenly Father, over you. God, we want to break those things, and we want to lay them down at your feet. And so, God, be with us in this moment as we worship you. I ask that you prompt the people who need to come to the altar to lay down the things that they need to lay down. God, we thank you that you are with us. Help us in this moment. And we worship you in your name. Amen. is going to remain open. I encourage you, if, 
if there is something that you are battling, if there is something that you need to be able to lay down to get closer to Jesus, this is the best time to do it. And so the altar is going to remain open. I want to go ahead. I want to close this in prayer. But I also want to encourage you throughout this week, humble yourself. Find yourself in worship. Surrender yourself to the will, to the plan that God has intended for you. So God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this word. God, we don't want to live a life of pride. We don't want to live any longer how we want to live. God, we repent for the religions that we have set up in our own lives. The religions that we've built up, the traditions that we have built up, however we want to be able to be seen as, however we want to live. We are sorry. We repent. But God, we thank you that you are redeeming. We thank you that you are building us up, that you are growing something new in our hearts. We thank you for the life that you have planted in our hearts. And we receive that life today, Heavenly Father. We ask that as we leave here today, that we're able to share that life, that we're able to go out to be a Christian, to be the light, to be the salt of the earth, Heavenly Father. God, we ask that as we leave here today, that we walk in humility, and pride is no longer our identity. It is no longer our false identity. We're walking how you want us to live, Heavenly Father. And so I bless your people today, Heavenly Father. I thank you, Father, that they listen to the voice of the good shepherd and the voice of a stranger. They will not follow. And so, God, again, we thank you for this moment. I bless your people, and we love you and praise you in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, church. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you tonight at LBR.